أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الله سبحانه وتعالى in ayah number 100 of surah At-Tawbah he says and as for the foremost the first among the emigrants and the helpers and those who followed them with virtue God is pleased with them and they are pleased with him and he has prepared for them gardens with rivers running below to live forever. That is the great triumph. The commentators of the Holy Quran, they say that these particular verses were revealed before the Holy Prophet and the Muslims who had joined him in Tabuk before they arrived back in Medina. And as we mentioned, this was a battle that never took place. And however, it was a battle that that was very taxing on the Prophet and the Muslim community. Because psychologically they had to prepare to go against a mighty force like the Roman Empire. It was a it was a, a military campaign that entailed a long, arduous journey. So there were a lot of difficulties associated with setting out towards Tabuk. Now upon their return, now you can imagine, they go, they spend all of this money, they spend all of this time away from their families. And upon returning, perhaps some of the Muslims who were with the Prophet were thinking to themselves, you know, what is the reward that we're going to be getting for this struggle? For our efforts. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala essentially says that your reward depends on your status before God. So all of these Muslims who had joined the Prophet are returning. Many of them are probably frustrated because you know in their minds we traveled all of this this long journey. You know we were separated from our families. We we lost a lot of our wealth, a lot of our resources. So this question naturally is going to arise. You know, what's the reward for this effort, for the struggle that we endured? Now here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as I mentioned, He highlights that your reward is based on your status before God. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala divides the early Muslims into three groups. The first is, the first, the foremost, who joined Islam, who supported the Prophet, when there was really no foreseeable benefit in doing so. These are the these are the this is the first category. Well Ansar and those who helped the Prophet when the Prophet no longer was able to remain in Mecca. Those Muslims who gave and provided a safe haven for the Prophet. والأنصار, and those who follow in their footsteps, the tabi'een, those who follow those individuals in virtue. So here are three groups. As الْأَوَّلُونَ مِنَ الْمُهَاجِرِينَ is number one. Number two are the Ansar. And number three are those who follow them in virtue. Now the first group occupies the highest status. Being first and foremost, according to this ayah, has a has particular value. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for example, when he speaks about Prophet Zakaria and his wife, when he describes these great personalities, he describes them as being kanu yusari'una fil khayrat, that they were the foremost in doing good. You see, brothers and sisters, it's one thing to do good, but to be the first to do good has a special status with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because it's more difficult to be the first and the foremost in doing something. To be the first one to speak out against a tyrant. To be the first one to support an initiative. Any action 
is going to be easier if others are doing it. If everyone is doing it, it's naturally going to be a lot more easier to go, you know, with the crowds, to join the wave. However, in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlights that those who are who have the most esteemed status in the eyes of God are asabiqun al awwaluna min al muhajirin. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and being the foremost is not only with respect to faith. You know, we can extend this concept to all good deeds. Being the first and the foremost to perform the daily prayers. Being the first ones to, to support, you know, the building of a masjid or the building of a hospital. To be the first ones to do any act of goodness. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Hadid, ayah number 21, he describes the believers as being, he says to them, Sabiqu ila maghfiratim mir rabbikum. That hasten towards the mercy of your Lord. Some ulama understand the mercy, the forgiveness of your Lord to be, to be the salah, the daily prayers. That because prayer represents our way of accessing God's mercy, hastening towards the forgiveness of God are the daily prayers. So getting into the habit of racing towards righteous deeds, being the first and the foremost, you know, be the one who sets the precedent for others to do good. And you find that even on the day of judgment, this, this category of individuals is also mentioned, you know, being the foremost. So in this ayah, Allah he divides the believers into the foremost, the helpers, and the those who followed them in virtue. On the day of judgment, after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala judges all people, all human beings at the end of the hisab, after the reckoning on the day of judgment, they will fall into one of three categories as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah Al-Waqi'ah, Surah Al-Waqi'ah verse, verses 7 to 11. Allah says, وَكُنْتُمْ أَزْوَاجًا ثَلَاثًا That you will be three groups on the day of Qiyamah. فَأَصْحَابُ الْمَيْمَنَةِ مَا أَصْحَابُ الْمَيْمَنَةِ You have the people of the right hand, those who did good, those who lived virtuous lives, those who passed the divine judgment on that day. Then you have the, the companions of the left hand. So you have Ashabul Yameen, Ashabul Al Maymana, and Ashabul Mash'ama. Now you may think that that's it. You know, on the day of judgment, we should just divide people into Ahlul Jannah and Ahlul Nah, people who are going to paradise and people who are doomed to the hellfire. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions a third class of people on the Day of Judgment. After mentioning Ashabul Maymana and Ashabul Mash'ama, Allah says, وَالسَّابِقُونَ السَّابِقُونَ And then the third group are the foremost of the foremost. And why are these individuals so great? أُولَٰئِكَ الْمُقَرَّبُونَ They are the ones who will be brought close to God. They are the ones who will enjoy this special divine proximity. Now, in the early Muslim community, of course, those who joined the Prophet early on, they have a special status. But without a doubt, the one who has the greatest status among the early Muslims is Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib In fact, we have many traditions from the Prophet where he speaks about Ali ibn Abi Talib being at the forefront, being the first one to formally, and of course I, I, use, I, I use the word formally intentionally because Ali ibn Abi Talib, it's not that he was a non-Muslim and then he became Muslim. He formally declared his, uh, his acceptance of the Sharia of the Holy Prophet because he was always a monotheist. Rasulullah says, Awalukum wurudan al hawl, the first one to meet me at the pool of Kawthar on the day of judgment, which seems 
from the traditions to be the only source of water for, for people on the Day of Judgment, the first one to join the Prophet on the Pool of Kothar, Rasulullah says, they will be the awalukum islam that the first one to join me on the Pool of Kothar is going to be the first one who had joined me in faith in this life. And then he says that it is none other than Ali ibn Abi Talib, salawatullahi alayhi. So again, if we take this concept of being a sabiqun, that we should apply this to all opportunities to do good. That you be the first one. You know, if you commit a sin, be the be raised towards repentance. When it's the time of salah, be the foremost, the first to offer the prayers. If you if there's an opportunity to sponsor an orphan, be the first one to step forward. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves those who are the foremost, who not only do good, but they're the first ones to answer the invitation to do goodness. And then you have the Ansar. The second group are the Ansar. Now the Ansar, who are they? The word Ansar comes from the word Nasara, which means to help. And these are the individuals who resided in Yathrib, which was the ancient name for the city of Medina. And when the Prophet migrated, it became known as Medina to Rasul, and they would call it Medina uh, for short. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in, in certain verses of the Quran, He praises the Ansar, especially the ones who demonstrated altruism and selfless, selflessness when the early Muslims arrived in Medina. If you look at, for example, Surah Al Hashr. Surah 59, ayah number 9, Allah gives us a very beautiful description of the attitude of the Ansar. You know, unfortunately today, in many parts of the world, residents of a country, they have a sort of contempt towards migrants, towards refugees. But here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the spirit of love that existed in the hearts of the Ansar and how they received, you know, these religious refugees, if we want to refer to them as that, these migrants. Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ تَبَوَّعُ الدَّارَ وَالْإِيمَانَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ يُحِبُّونَ مَنْ هَاجَرَ إِلَيْهِمْ That the Ansar, when they receive news that the Muslims are migrating from Medina, from Mecca to Medina, they were happy. In fact, Allah says, يُحِبُّونَ مَنْ هَاجَرَ إِلَيْهِمْ They love those who have migrated to them. وَلَا يَجِدُونَ فِي صُدُورِهِمْ حَاجَةً مِمَّا أُوتُوا That when these early Muslims, when the migrant Muslims arrived in Medina, of course, they were homeless. The Ansar literally had to open up their homes to them. And you see that they had to share their households with these individuals. They had to share their food. They had to provide for them. Now you may ask, did they do this reluctantly? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, that they never felt, they never felt any uh, greed or any stinginess when they were giving to the Muhajireen. And they would give to the Muhajireen, even if it meant that they deprived themselves. Even if there was not enough food to eat, they would prefer to give it to their brethren in faith. And then you have the third group. So we said, وَالسَّابِقُونَ الْأَوَّلُونَ مِنَ الْمُهَاجِرِينَ وَالْأَنصَارِ Number two. And number three is, وَالَّذِينَ تَبَعُوهُمْ بِإِحْسَانٍ And those who followed them. You know, brothers and sisters, the Arabs in the pre-Islamic era, they used to blindly follow their predecessors. But here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, and those who follow them, in virtue, 
والذين تبعوهم بإحسان those who follow them in virtue meaning follow the good that they do follow them in in virtue don't blindly follow them because here it's almost as though the Quran is foreshadowing that many perhaps many of these muhajirin and the ansar they will fall into sin they will do things that are against the sharia don't follow them blindly don't say that all oh, the companions of the prophet are like stars which is a fabricated hadith ashabi kan nujum that whoever you follow among them you will be guided that's not the case Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ تَبَعُونَ بِإِحْسَانٍ Follow them in virtue. But if they commit vice, don't follow them. What's the reward for these individuals? Allah says, رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُمْ وَرَضُوا عَنْهُمْ So Allah, when He speaks about the reward that He's going to give them, which is paradise, the first thing that He mentions, the first thing that Allah highlights is... A spiritual reward the first blessing and the most important blessing in paradise is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's approval his pleasure that radiyallahu anhum that God is pleased with them he will be pleased with them and they will be pleased with God meaning that whatever expectation they have of Allah of what he's going to give them Allah will exceed their expectations and they will be fully pleased with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prepared for them. Now when it comes to, if I go back for a moment to the, the idea of following, following those in virtue. You know, the, the second generation Muslims were known as tabi'een. So you have a Sahabi, a Sahabi is anyone who saw the Prophet and died as a Muslim. Even if they saw the Prophet only for a few moments, even if they looked at the Prophet and they left and they never spoke to the Prophet, they're considered a Sahabi. But, they, but individuals who never met the Prophet, but they met companions of the Prophet and they studied under companions of the Prophet, they were known as Tabi'een. Now, there's an interesting hadith, you know, because, you know, we speak often about the, the status of companions and those who are, who are not the companions of the Prophet. There's an interesting hadith where the Prophet ﷺ was sitting with his companions. He was sitting with his ashab. And he says, Ishtaqtu ila ikhwani, that I yearn to be with my brothers and my sisters. So the Sahaba who are sitting in the presence of the Prophet, they say to the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, awalasna ikhwanuk? Ya Rasulullah, are we not your brothers? Rasulullah says to them, Antum ashabi, that you are my companions. Ikhwani qawmun ya'tuna ba'di yu'minuna bi wa lam yarawni. That my brethren, my brothers, and my sisters are the ones who will come after me. And they will believe in me even though they have never seen me. Rasulullah says, I am yearning to meet them, to meet my brethren. And we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to make us among uh, these individuals, these, you know, this group. Ayah number 101, Allah says, So in the previous verse, Allah mentions these different categories of believers. And he mentions the reward that they will receive, beginning with a spiritual reward. And then he speaks about the material blessings in the forms of gardens and rivers. And this is a reward that will never end because it is eternal. And that is, of course, the great triumph. Here, Allah says, again, going back to the topic of nifaq. So here we see this contrast. Allah mentions the good. The pious, and then he mentions 
the wicked, among the Bedouin around you, there are hypocrites. And among the people of Medina, who are headstrong in, hypocr in hypocrisy, you don't know them. We know them. And we shall punish them twice. They shall be relegated to a great punishment. Now it's interesting, brothers and sisters, that when we look at this verse, as I as I mentioned in our previous sessions, Surah at tawbah is among the last surahs that have been revealed, that were revealed to the Prophet. So we're so if we look at the Prophet's life, this is about two years before the death of the Prophet. In ayah number 101, Allah is telling the Muslims, He's telling the Prophet that you are surrounded by a munafiqeen. وَمِمَّنْ حَوْلَكُمْ And among you and around you and encircling you are munafiqeen. And the munafiqeen are from the desert dwellers and the people who live in the city. So this is not a phenomenon where it's only one group of people and it's very easy to pinpoint them. There are some of the nomadic Arabs, the desert dwelling Arabs who are munafiqeen. You know, they live in the desert. They don't really live with the Muslim community. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says that women ahli al-madinati maradu al nifaq You can't say, oh, the munafiqeen, they're the ones who live all the way out in the desert and they rarely mingle with the Muslim community. No. Allah says, وَمِنْ أَهْلِ الْمَدِينَةِ مَرَدُوا عَلَى النِّفَاقِ The word maradu means that they're very stubborn, that hypocrisy has become second nature to them. Maradu عَلَى النِّفَاقِ They are headstrong in hypocrisy. Now I ask, you know, the following question has to be asked. What happened to these people after the death of the Prophet? Did, they, did, Allah, did they just vanish? Did they just go up into the sky? Did the earth swallow them? When the Quran says, وَمِمَّنْ حَوْلَكُمْ مِنَ الْأَعْرَابِ مُنَافِقُونَ وَمِنْ أَهْلِ الْمَدِينَةِ مَرَدُوا عَلَى النِّفَاقِ That those who are around you from among the desert-dwelling Arabs and the people of Medina who are headstrong in hypocrisy, what, hap what happened to them? Did they all of a sudden become mu'mineen when the Prophet died? That means that there is a strong community of hypocrites in the in um, in the presence of the prophet what happened to them it would be naive to act as though they had no role in what happened after the death of the prophet allah says maradu ala nifaq these are not people who are you know who exhibit hypocritical behavior allah says maradu ala nifaq that it's it's become a part of them they are so stubborn so hypocritical and and the scariest part, my dear brothers and sisters, is Allah says, La ta'lamu. That these munafiqeen were so good at hiding their hypocrisy that even the Prophet was not able to identify them. Allahu Akbar. Even the Prophet, if it was not for divine inspiration, the Prophet would have mistakenly assumed that they are believers. And it really makes you think. Allah says, La Oh Muhammad, you don't know them. Who knows them? Nahnu we know them. So the only way that the Prophet knew who the identity of these individuals is, is was through inspiration, through revelation. This is why the Prophet he used to do, he used to pray. Salatul Mayit over a munafiq do, doing only four takbiras. When he would do it over a believer, he would do he would do it five times. So he knew who was a munafiq and who was a mu'min, but the only way that he knew was not just through human observation, it was through divine disclosure. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inspired his heart. He revealed to the Prophet who are the munafiqeen. La ta'lamuhum. So the following point, I'd like to make the following point. After the death of the Prophet, these munafiqeen still existed. 
if the Prophet needed revelation to identify the Munafiqeen in his life, do you think that the majority of the Ummah will, will be able to identify who the Munafiqeen are? If the Prophet needs divine intervention to allow him to identify the hypocrites, it doesn't make sense to say, oh, but how did all of these individuals give bay'ah to Fulan? Because they didn't know. Many of them, they didn't know. If the Prophet needed wahi for him to know who the munafiqeen are, yes, it's possible for the majority of the ummah to be fooled. To assume that someone is a believer while in fact they are a hypocrite. Even if they become the khalifa. لا تعلمهم نحن نعلمهم سنعذبهم مرتين Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he threatens the munafiqeen. You know, sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, Allah at the end of the day, He cares about the munafiqeen. He wants to guide them. Allah is more interested in guiding the, hypoc the hypocrites than punishing them, which is why He makes this threat. Sometimes Allah, you know, as, as the saying goes, sometimes, you know, you use the carrot and sometimes you use the stick. Here Allah is using the stick. سَنُعَذِّبُهُمْ مَرَّتَيْنِ ثُمَّ يُرَدُّونَ إِلَىٰ عَذَابٍ عَظِيمٍ We will punish them twice. Now the Mufassireen, they, they ask, what does it mean when Allah says He will punish them twice? ثُمَّ يُرَدُّونَ إِلَىٰ عَذَابٍ عَظِيمٍ And then they will be relegated to a great punishment. So after being punished twice, then they get Jahannam. So you can't say, oh, the, first, the one punishment is in dunya and the other one is in the akhirah. Allah already said that they will then be sent to a painful punishment. So there are two punishments that happen before they enter Jahannam. We will punish them twice and then they shall be relegated to a great punishment. So these two punishments are not related to Jahannam. So where are these punishments going to take place? Some of the Mufassireen, they say, the Munafiqeen will be punished in this life. They will suffer humiliation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in some way, in some form, He will exact His punishment and His wrath upon them in this life. And then the second time, some ulama say on their deathbeds, their their death is going to be so painful that the second punishment will be in the way that they die. The pain that they experience when they see Malakul Maut. And some scholars have said that it's a reference to Adabul Qadr, that they're going to be punished in this life and they're going to be punished in the grave. And then after the punishment in, in this life and in the grave, they're going to end up in Jahannam. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He makes a threat. Now, in the next ayah, ayah number 102, now keep in mind that this threat against the munafiqeen, this verse is revealed even before the Prophet returns to Medina. Some of those who didn't join the Prophet in Tabuk, who stayed behind, became frightened when this ayah was revealed. Some of the people who stayed behind in, Medi in Medina, when this ayah was revealed, where Allah threatens to punish them twice, it scared some of the early Muslims. And this is why, you re we, as we read in, read in the next verse, ayah number 102, وَآخَرُونَ اَعْتَرَفُوا بِذُنُوبِهِمْ خَلَطُوا عَمَلًا صَالِحًا وَآخَرَ سَيِّئًا عَسَى اللَّهُ أَن يَتُوبَ عَلَيْهِمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ غَفُورٌ رَّحِيمٌ And there are others. So you have some who are headstrong in their hypocrisy and there are others who exhibited hypocritical behavior and there are others who admit their sins. They mixed righteous deeds with others that are evil. It may be that God will accept your repentance. Surely God is forgiving and merciful. 
So when this, so when the previous ayah was revealed about the threat of being punished twice and being relegated to a uh, a great punishment, some of the Muslims, some of the companions who didn't join the Prophet, who failed to join the Prophet, who made excuses as to why they weren't able to participate in this military campaign, they became terrified. Among those who felt remorse for not joining the Prophet in Tabuk was a man by the name of Abu Lubab al-Ansari. And there were a group of others who felt so ashamed, who felt guilt for not joining the Prophet. And they, became, they began to cry when Allah revealed the ayah that He will punish them twice for their hypocrisy. What they did was Abu Lubab, for example, in the, in the Masjid of the Prophet, he tied himself to a pillar in one of the, one of the pillars of, in the mosque. And he said that I am not going to release myself until Rasulullah pardons me. So they tie, a group of them, Abu Lubab and a few others, they tied themselves to one of the posts, one of the pillars in the mosque of the Prophet. And they were crying and making Tawbah. And they said, we're going to remain here until the Prophet himself unties us. Until we get the Maghfirah through the Prophet. So the Prophet ﷺ, he arrives. He arrives in Medina. Abu Lubaba, his eyes are filled with tears. He's begging Allah for forgiveness. He's begging the Prophet to pardon him. And he says that, Ya Rasulullah, I will not untie myself until you untie me as an indication that I have been pardoned. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he says, I cannot do anything. I have to wait for revelation. And therefore, this ayah was revealed, the ayah that I just recited. And there are others who admit their sins. Abu Lubaba is not a bad person. He did good, but he also did evil. He committed a great sin by failing to join the Prophet. Allah here says, maybe God will accept their repentance. Now you may ask, why did Allah say maybe? If they're repenting and they're tying themselves to the pillar of the masjid and they're 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 remorseful they're regretful why does allah say maybe i will forgive them is it because allah is unsure no allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does this for the same reason why we tell our children you know for example if your son or your daughter they misbehave and they come to you and they say baba can i have ice cream tonight what do you say to them maybe we'll see you don't give them a definitive answer. Why? Because they misbehave and you tell them maybe so they can be conscious of the way that they conduct themselves. So they, they're, they're very cautious about the way that they behave. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he says maybe I'll pardon you, this is an invitation. Allah wants to motivate them to reform themselves, that you need to put in, I'll forgive you, but you need to put in more effort. You need to demonstrate that you have reformed yourself. So when this ayah was revealed where Allah says, maybe God will forgive you, Abu Lubaba panics even more, that not only have I been condemned by God, God has not given, given me a clear indication that he has accepted my repentance. So what does Abu Lubaba do? Abu Lubaba was wealthy. He turns to the Prophet and he says, Ya Rasulullah, to demonstrate how remorseful I am, how much I regret not joining you, I am willing to give, I am giving all of my wealth to you to support Islam. So Abu Lubaba, he's, he's taking this very seriously. His failure to join the Prophet the excuses that he put forward. Abu Lubaba now is saying, Ya Rasulullah, all, all of my wealth is yours. Just ask Allah to pardon me. I just want Allah's forgiveness. I don't want anything. Take all of my money. And then Allah reveals ayah number 103, the next verse. 
خذ من أموالهم صدقة تطهرهم وتزكيهم بها وصل عليهم إن صلاتك سكن لهم والله سميع عليم Allah says take a charitable offering from their wealth cleansing and purifying them and bless them truly your blessings are a, com are a comfort for them and God is all hearing and all knowing. So Abu Lubaba al Ansari, he offers all of his wealth to the Prophet. Allah says, don't take all of it, take a portion of it, take one third of it, as some of the narrations indicate. Take one third of it. Now, why? Now, someone might think, you know, someone who's observing this, that the Prophet is taking one third of Abu Lubaba's wealth. That, oh, the Prophet is, is benefiting. That Rasulullah is the beneficiary because he's taking the money of Abu Lubaba. Allah says, no, Ya Rasulullah, make sure they know that when you take their sadaqat, that they are the beneficiaries, that you are benefiting them. How is the Prophet benefiting them? خُذْ مِنْ أَمْوَالِهِمْ صَدَقَةً تُطَهِرُهُمْ That giving something in the way of God Giving charity purifies them. Purifies them from what? From greed. From hubbud dunya. It helps them detach from this material world. It purifies their hearts from the disease of the love of this material world. What to zakihim cleanses them and it purifies them. You know, the Prophet ﷺ, when people used to give zakat, khums, sadaqah, when they would bring their money to him and they would give, the Prophet would make dua for them. He would say, Allahumma salli alayhi. Oh Allah, send your blessings upon so and so. Allah tells the Prophet that whenever they give you their religious dues, whether it's charity, obligatory religious dues, whatever it may be. You know, because it's hard for people to give money, you know, it, it, it burns them. Allah tells the Prophet, make it easier for them to give by making dua for them. And many of the mu'mineen, they would be motivated to give because they wanted to earn the dua of the Prophet. Inna salataka sakanun lahum, that your salat, that your blessing, your dua for them, it brings sakina to their hearts. It brings comfort to their hearts. Wallahu sami'un alim. You know, there's a there's an interesting narration where a man, one of the Shias, he writes a letter to Imam Ali ibn Musa Ridha, our eighth Imam. And in in the letter, this man he says, Ya ibn Rasulullah, can you excuse me from paying khums? So he wants to ask, he's asking the Imam to exempt him from paying any khums that year. You know, he wants a waiver from the, from the Imam. He, he says, oh Imam, please excuse me from paying khums this year. I don't want to pay anything. Do you know what Imam al says? He says, he says to this person, why do you wish to deny yourself the dua that we make for you. That when you give khums to Imam al rida when you give zakat to Imam al rida when you give your khums today to your marja, you have to keep in mind that you are earning something much better, that what you're gaining is much more than what, when, what, than what you're giving. At the very least, you are gaining the dua of the imam so whenever you when you when you don't pay khums when you don't pay zakat you are depriving yourself of what wasalli alayhim this the blessing of the prophet of the imam so the prophet used to do it for those who are at his time and when we give the sadaqat when we give the alms when we give zakat and khums it's the 12th imam who is saying Allahumma salli alayhi. So Imam al-Rada says, why, why do you wish to deprive yourself 
of the dua that we make for you when you give these charitable offerings. In the next ayah, Allah says, أَلَمْ يَعْلَمُوا أَنَّ اللَّهَ يَقْبَلُ التَّوْبَةَ عَنْ عِبَادِهِ وَيَأْخُذُ الصَّدَقَاتِ وَأَنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ التَّوَّابُ الرَّحِيمُ Do they not know that God accepts repentance from His servants and receives the charitable offerings and God accepts repentance, He's oft forgiving and merciful? Now, when Allah says, Alam ya'lamu anna Allah yaqbalu tawbata an ibadih, you know, when the Prophet tells Abu Lubaba that you've been forgiven, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who's actually forgiving. You know, sometimes when you when you wrong someone and you find it difficult to go and ask them for forgiveness, you know, when you ask a person for forgiveness, in essence, you're asking Allah to pardon you. So for those who have difficulty asking people to forgive them and pardon them for, for the wrong that we do, that you always have to remember that you are doing it because ultimately you want Allah to accept your tawbah. Don't you know that God is the one who receives your charity? Don't think that Oh, this is going to the prophet, or this is going to that person. You know, sometimes when you give chair people who give charity, you know, they think to themselves, "Oh, this person, maybe if they worked harder, you know, they would have, they wouldn't be poor." And we do it sometimes begrudgingly, reluctantly. Allah is the one who is receiving the charity. Sometimes you have to look past the recipient. Because in the Islamic tradition, it's more it's more important that it's more important that you that you give. The giver receives greater benefit than the recipient. You know that's why even during the time of the twelfth Imam, people will want to give zakat, but there's no one to receive it. But that doesn't matter because the instruction to give will always be there irrespective of whether there's a recipient or not, because we need to give to develop our spirituality, to purify our hearts and our souls from the, uh, the love of this life. And when Imam, when Imam Zain al-Abideen salam, it is reported that when he used to give charity, Imam al-Sajjad used to kiss his own hands. He would kiss his own hands when he would give charity. And when the Imam alayhi salam was asked about this, he says, "Inna sadaqata la taqa'u fi yad al-abd hatta taqa'a fi yad al-rab." Imam al-Sajjad he says, "Before the money, before the charity reaches the hands of the person, they reach the hand of God, the metaphorical hand of God." And the Imam alayhi salam mentions this ayah. وَيَأْخُذُ الصَّدَقَاتِ وَإِنَّ اللَّهُ هُوَ التَّوَّابُ الرَّحِيمُ The next ayah, ayah number 105, and we'll conclude here. وَقُلْ اعْمَلُوا وَقُلْ اعْمَلُوا فَسَيَرَ اللَّهُ عَمَلَكُمْ وَرَسُولُهُ وَالْمُؤْمِنُونَ وَسَتُرَدُّونَ إِلَىٰ عَالِمِ الْغَيْبِ وَالشَّهَادَةِ فَيُنَبِّئُكُمْ بِمَا كُنْتُمْ تَعْمَلُونَ Say, Perform your deeds. God will see your deeds, His messenger and the believers. And then you will return to the knower of the unseen and the seen, and He will inform you of what you used to do. Now this ayah, brothers and sisters, is, is a very important verse. Because according to this verse, whenever you do anything, any amal, whether it's good or bad, there are three groups that are witnessing your actions, whether you're in public or in private. So for example, if I go to the masjid and the masjid is completely empty and I put some money in the charity box and there's no one there, 
This ayah says there are three groups who witnessed that deed. It's not only Allah. God will see your deeds. Now we all know that. It's because Allah is everywhere. He's, on, uh, he's omnipresent. Not only does God witness your deeds, there is a type of ilmul ghayb that is given to two other groups. Because to be able to see deeds, both private and public, requires the granting of knowledge of the unseen. The Messenger of God witnesses your deeds. And the believers. So when I, if I'm in the masjid and I'm alone and I drop some money in a uh, in the box of charity, Allah witnesses it. The Prophet witnesses it. Who are these mu'minun? Who are these believers that witness our actions? The Imams of Ahlul Bayt they say that it's the the Imams. The 12 Imams of Ahlul Bayt. There's a hadith from Imam Jafar al Sadiq where he says, That the deeds of people are presented to the Prophet. Every morning, every day, the actions of people are presented to the Prophet. So even though the Prophet has passed away, in Alamul Barzakh, he still has the status of being a shahid, as the Quran says, that he is shahidan wa mubashiran wa nadira, that he witnesses the actions. Abraraha wa fujaraha that he witnesses the evil deeds and the good deeds. In another hadith, the Prophet says, And every day, some narrations say every Thursday, or but many narrations say that this happens every day. Whenever I see that you do good, I make dua that Allah gives you the tawfiq to do more good, that Allah enables you to do more. When I see that the believers, they commit sins, the Prophet, because he's rahmatan lil alameen, even in alam al barzakh, he's asking Allah to pardon and to forgive the believers for their iniquities, for their sins, for their shortcomings. And after, after this, you will go back to the knower of the seen and the unseen. See, therefore, you know, someone might read this verse and say, oh, refers to the day of judgment. Now on the day of judgment, Allah will witness your deeds, the prophet and the believers. But look at the verse. The beginning of it, Allah mentions who witnesses our deeds. And then Allah says, and, and then you will go back to the knower of the seen and the unseen, which means those three categories witness our deeds in this life. Because at the end of the ayah, Allah says, and then you will go back to the knower of the seen and the unseen. And he will inform you of what you used to do. We ask Allah Azza wa to bless us and guide us and illuminate our hearts with the teachings of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad wa akhir da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطاهرين. Any questions or comments? So uh, when it comes to taking alms of uh, people's property, uh, in verse one hundred three, yes, referring only to uh, basically not to, only to not refusing people's charity because at least the way I'm seeing it written, it could be implied to even refer to forcibly taking alms out of someone's property. 
So if you recall, when we spoke about uh, the recipients of zakat earlier in the surah, we mentioned that in the early history of Islam, zakat, you know, people used to voluntarily offer their, offer their zakat. Where people used to basically come to the Prophet and, and give him the, uh, the zakat. Now when the Prophet, and of course some would give and some would not. When the Prophet established his his government in Medina, you know, in this you know this ayah, for example, is one of the uh, one of the verses that where Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So it was revealed specifically about Abu Lubaba and and those who were with him. But it it's, it also highlights a change in the way that uh, zakat is collected. So people used to voluntarily come to the Prophet and give zakat, but now. The Prophet is authorized to collect zakat. So that's why the Prophet appoints zakat collectors. So, so before the Prophet would wait and they would come and give him. So here Allah is saying, take zakat from them. Take from their wealth. So there's a command that is directed towards the Prophet to be to be actively collecting zakat from people. And not just be one who is passively accepting it. So there's there's a change in the way that the uh, the zakat is uh, is being collected. So now that now that there's a state, now that a government has been established, you don't just it's not just left to the prerogative of the citizen to give whenever they want to give. No, there's a system now. There are tax collectors. You know, there's a it's 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 a considered a crime to withhold the zakat. It's punishable. So uh, here the Prophet is authorized to, to collect, to take the zakat from the people. I see. Thank you. And uh, also what uh, uh, going back to verse, verses 101 and 102, yes. when um, people were, or when Allah was talking about the punishment of the munafiqeen and then others heard about uh, that verse and repented because of it. Yeah. If the army was still returning back from the battle when the verses were revealed, how did the people who were in Medina hear about these verses if the army hadn't reached back yet? So if if you recall, the the, the army that the Prophet had assembled was about thirty about thirty thousand. Now, when you have thirty thousand people, and and when I say that they heard, they heard before the Prophet arrived. So they might have heard a few hours or you know maybe a day before the prophet actually arrived in medina so when you have a large army like that traveling naturally there are going to be some people who who uh who arrive uh, earlier than others because you know, thirty thousand people that's a huge army so there might have been people who are more eager to get back to medina for whatever reason and they might have mentioned that this eye was revealed and then you know, news started to spread, and then the rest of the army arrives, and the prophet arrives with them. So that that's how I imagine uh, they would have uh, heard about the prof, uh, the ayah before the the prophet arrived. Because as you as you know, you know when when ayat are being revealed, the prophet shares it with those who are with him. So if there are thirty thousand with him in in Tabuk, and these ayat are being revealed, you know, naturally those who heard perhaps arrived. In Medina before the Prophet arrived, and uh, these uh, verses began circulating among the uh, the residents of Medina. And um, could you just talk a little bit about on verse one hundred? It seems to be giving a blanket approval of all the Ansar and Muhajirin. So even in the next verse, you kind of hinted that um, that there may have been some among them who were not doing as good deeds. Yeah. So. Uh, ayah number 100, the first one? Yes. So, وَالسَّابِقُونَ الْأَوَّلُونَ مِنَ الْمُهَاجِرِينَ وَالْأَنصَارِ Now, <clears throat> if you look at the last part of this verse, so the, the argument is that, and, and some Sunnis have, have used this to say that, look, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is unconditionally praising the... Uh, the Muhajirin and uh, and the Ansar. First of all, we have to bear in mind that Allah is is praising wasabiqun al awwaluna min al Muhajirin. That's not all the Muhajirin; it's the the foremost among the Muhajirin. 
and then the Ansar. Now, someone say, oh, does this mean all of the Ansar were pious? And those who follow them in virtue. Now, if all three groups were perfectly righteous, it wouldn't make sense for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to qualify with the word Ihsan. Allah could have just said, and those who followed them. But the fact that Allah says, and those who followed them in virtue indicates that do not follow the vices that they commit. Furthermore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what does he say at the end of the ayah? That he has prepared for them gardens with rivers. Now, just because Allah has prepared something, it doesn't mean that they're going to be given it. Now, if they deviate, what has been prepared will not be given to them. So Allah doesn't say that they will enter Jannah. Allah says it has been prepared for them. If they continue on the straight path, they will be admitted into this Jannah. But for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to say that it's been prepared for you, that, that it's not an indication that they will, they will definitely be granted this reward. You know, it's the same example that I gave, you know, before, where if you're, uh, you know, if, if your child has a number of exams, you have a son, a daughter, they have a number of exams. And they pass, they have five exams coming up, and they do well on two or three of them, and they have two more to go. You say for them that I have prepared a reward for you, that I, I, I have a bike ready for you, and it's yours as long as you pass the rest of the exams. Now, if they fail the last two, that doesn't mean that I'm going to give them, you know, the bike that I've prepared. It's prepared. It's there, provided that you that you excel on the the future exams. So here, the same principle applies that Jannah is prepared for them based on what they did. But if, if but in order for them to be granted this reward, they have to maintain. That piety and that righteousness, they can't, they can't deviate. Because uh, that, that was a really good point, that this is it's saying that these things have been prepared for you, but not that these will be given to you. That was really interesting. Wa'addalam, yeah. It's, it's not that they will be, they will enter uh, paradise. It's prepared. And, and we have many examples of, you know, just the hadith, you know, when, when people, when some of the companions when the Prophet said, you know, whenever you do tasbih, a tree is planted in paradise for you. When you do tasbih, a tree is planted in paradise for you, according to some narrations. So some of the Sahaba, they say, Ya Rasulullah, there must be a lot of trees in paradise. The Prophet responds by saying, yes, but be careful not to set them on fire with your sins. So just because a tree is planted in Jannah, it doesn't mean that it's going to stay there. You might destroy it through your future sins. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, thank you very much. And it was also really interesting about how this verse is, uh, emphasizes the need to be first or the extra virtue of being first to do good deeds. Because I mean, when you do good deeds, you're paving the way for other people to also do good deeds. That was that was really interesting. Exactly. exactly. You, you're, you're setting a precedent. And by setting a precedent, you also are a partner with those who follow in your footsteps. So, so you're a partner with them in the thawat by setting that, you know, that sunnah hasana, that uh, you establish a good practice. Those who follow you in, in performing that act of goodness, you're a partner with them in the reward. Yeah, there's so many ways that people kind of get stuck in their existing uh, way of doing things. You've got, I mean, there's a bystander effect, just inertia sets in, then you see someone else doing something good, and that can jumpstart you into doing good as well. Exactly. Exactly. And uh, there's a question. Which level of the believers can see the actions of the prophet? Can you repeat the question? Uh, which level of the, because uh, you said that, um, sorry, which levels of believers can see the actions of the people related to the last verse? 
which levels of believers can see the actions of people. So the so these believers in the last verse, uh, I number one hundred five. These are. This is a reference to the imams, because again, when Allah says, "Fasayara Allahu amalakum wa rasuluhu wal mu'minun," Allah sees the actions of people. The Prophet sees the actions of people and the mu'minun. The mu'minun here is uh, the twelve imams of Ahlul Bayt. You know, for example, when Imam al-Sadiq was asked, you know, who is Al Mu'minun, he says, Humul A'imma, that they are the Imams. This is a type of knowledge of the unseen. Because if you're if you're at home and there's no one home and you commit a sin or you do Salatul Layl, how are the Mu'mineen gonna know about it? Now Allah, of course, He, he's, he knows all things. The Prophet is granted this, this knowledge. Our deeds are presented to him. So, how about this third group? They must be individuals who are of a similar spiritual caliber to the prophet that they are also worthy of this knowledge of the unseen so again th this is they're witnessing this in this life in dunya because at the end of the verse as i mentioned allah speaks about returning to god and the akhir so the believers they're the ma'sumin the the, uh, the imams of ahlul bayt and i'm sure you can hear my daughter in the background banging on the door <laughs> Yeah, so mu'min so mu'minun doesn't just mean ordinary believers and mean various events of the future that were revealed to him. Uh, so why, based on that, why was it? What could be the reason that Allah, uh, that that Allah did not make the prophet aware of the munafiqin who were around him? Can you? I didn't hear the first part of the question. Can you repeat the first part of the question? The Prophet gave, or the Prophet had many types of uh, ilm al ghaib that he was given and many events of the future that he was aware of. So, why was he not, uh, why was we not told about the munafiqeen who were among him, or why was he not aware of all the munafiqeen among him? So, the, the Prophet was informed of the of the munafiqeen. What, what the verse, you know, ayah number 101, when Allah says, La ta'lamuhu, that you don't know them. It means that based on natural human observation, based on your own assessment, you would not know them. نحن نعلم. So Allah did, He did reveal to the Prophet who the munafiqeen were. But the point that the ayah is trying to make is that the munafiqeen were so skillful at hiding their hypocrisy and blending with the other believers that had it not been for divine inspiration you don't you wouldn't have known them la ta'lam you don't know them so the, the prophet knows about them because of ilm al ghaib so it's not that he just naturally figured it out so allah did so the prophet knew who the munafiqeen were but he, he didn't he wasn't able to ascertain that through natural means so he wasn't just hit through his natural ability through human observation, but rather it was through uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's revelation to him. In verse 104, it's interesting that it, say, it says that Allah accepts repentance and takes alms. And it lists in that order, not the other way around. That you have to uh, first, he'll accept your repentance before he takes the alms. And we hear the other way around mentioned in History and other sources. Yeah, yeah. Because think about it. I mean, when do good deeds really have an effect? You know, a good deed only has value when uh, when you eliminate sin from the equation. You know, what, what's the point in you know praying salatul layl? While you while you miss Salatul Fajr every morning, or you backbite, so acts of righteousness are 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 beneficial and they have value only when you're able to stop sinning. You know, it, it's kind of like you know the example that I give is that you know when you go to the gym, 
lifting weights and you know doing cardio is only going to have value if you stop eating junk food you know if you're eating mcdonald's every day and then you go to the gym that workout routine is not going to have much value so you have to purge that toxic material from your body to then see the results of uh, your workout regimen similarly when you when you ask Allah for forgiveness and he accepts your toba and he wipes your sins when you give charity that good deed is going to have more value so perhaps Allah alam that maybe that's why the, the order is in that way that's just you know my uh, my understanding